Thank you so much. And thank you and Satrikal to everyone uh, joining today from different time zones. Really excited to be here. And I really wanna thank all the organizers. It feels like a long time ago when Amandeep first uh, reached out and I've really enjoyed uh, conversations with this team over the months um, leading up to today. So thank you so much. I'm gonna go ahead and share a few images with you as we get started. Um, Okay, so uh, so that was a beautiful introduction. Thank you, Jigbe, you're very generous. Um, by what I would love to add to that, which I think is important to set the context for this book and, uh, and the remarks to come are, by way of personal background, if I were to introduce what I see myself or have seen myself focus on pretty much my whole, whole life is conversations, um, is being drawn to conversations that I'm told somehow are not happening or simply couldn't be happening or I heard wrong or I shouldn't be interested in. And you know, this is a factor of having grown up in the 80s Punjab as a child of the 80s, growing up in Punjab uh, during the conflict. Um, it's all the more also a factor of growing up a young girl uh, in Punjab. So this question of voice has been really important about who is speaking, who is not speaking, who is asked to stay silent, when, why, um, and how do people try to speak and how do people try to resist? So this has been a general theme of what's interested me. Um, and in, in some ways, just always I've been drawn to these conversations and questions. And this is the curiosity that eventually led to what became this book. This book was never a, um, you know, it was never a research project. I never went out with some timeline or some sort of uh, university plan or proposal behind me or anything. It was really a listening exercise that uh, culminated eventually in the form of a book. And the listening exercise began, like I said, from my childhood. And I think situating myself there is important because I had lingering question as uh, questions as a young girl, child of the 80s, a sick child of the 80s Punjab that eventually um, I was able to explore and was even able to frame to people around me in a, in a more coherent way as I grew older, as I had um, studied conflicts in other parts of the world, as I worked on human rights and gender justice in very different contexts than Punjab, but eventually um, realized that some of the same questions apply to Punjab and should apply to Punjab and the silence, um, silence needs to be broken in more in more nuanced ways, um, in ways that uh, allow for a lot of difference and a lot of voices. So that's just giving you a little sense of my approach coming into this. And I also think explaining, um, situating myself is really important because I don't ever pretend in this book um, or in any of the work really that I do that there's some sort of completely objective, unbiased, standard. I don't think, um, you know, we like using those words, but I don't think anyone comes without their personal and life experiences. So they, they inform all the work I do. So I, I wanted to put that out there. Um, for those who may not be aware, I would love to also give some context about the, the conflict itself. And so I'm going to read a little bit just from the introduction of the book, just to situate, um, again, where what we mean when we say Punjab's conflict years and what we mean about the unusual voices. So, so what is the usual narrative around Punjab? So I'm, I'm looking at page eight, page nine, right in the introduction of the book. Um, and I say here, those days are what I set out to understand, Odin, because people often referred in euphemisms to the time, the two decades of conflict in Punjab um, as, you know, Unadinavich. So those days are what I set out to understand. An entire period packed too neatly into one word, militancy, and with passing time, terrorism, out of which peak mysterious questions. And then I go on to say, the official government story is of religious extremism by one uneducated ideologue that necessitated mass state response in 1984, prompting more misguided youth backed by ever opportunistic neighbor Pakistan spreading terror in the countryside, which was brought back from the brink only after New Delhi intervened and oversaw valiant counterinsurgency operations with Punjab police sacrifices. The opposing story, is of a systematic program of elimination of Sikh power and pride since 1947, protested first peacefully, even as the state's treachery deepened, and then fiercely under a saintly Sikh leader whose own gruesome killing during the assault across Punjab's religious sites in 1984, solidified the second-class status of Sikhs in India, 
which was then resisted by a militant movement, which in turn provided the government further pretext to hunt six for the next decade. And the, what the book asks, as I go on to say a little later in this um, introduction is, in our world at once riveted and recoiled by violence, this book asks what might shift in our collective understanding and action if we spent nearly as much time fascinated by everyday people and unarmed human rights defenders as we are by the eroticism of violence and the romanticism of resistance. Highlighting the fight against fatalism in a specific context, this book seeks to raise questions for the reader's own contexts and to disrupt today's general pessimism around citizen, citizen activism in the face of oppression. So this, this book, because, I, it, because it resulted from years of, of listening and having conversations and going back to people, there's no, there's no one person quoted in this book um, in terms of the direct stories that I've, um, I'm telling, there's, there's no one situation where I can think of where I just talked to somebody once. I, there was many conversations that over time, I'd go back and say, well, you said this last time, like, can you tell me more? Or who else was there? Or, you know, were there any women there? Like all these questions I'd go back about. But one thing I also really noted in, in having these conversations was how our memory works. And this is um, part of my professional life now is talking to lawyers um, I'm, I'm also trained as an attorney, um, talking to lawyers about trauma and how trauma works. And this was this uh, this talking to our people, talking to six, giving their accounts and memories of the years of uh, post-1984. It was so clear that the history before 84, indeed before the 70s, before the 60s, even before partition, um, would come up so very often. People would uh, come in and have stories that not only problematized any sort of binary telling of, of the history, but also would refer to earlier trends in our history, earlier things that came up for them you know, that really conjured up in their mind's eye as they were um, re you know, recounting an, an episode from just two decades ago. They're also remembering something that happened five decades ago and both those, those things happened and they told those things simultaneously. So I, you know, it, it's an inconvenient way in which I, I uh, confess as an author, it's an inconvenient way in which I tell the story in the book, because I think that the convenient ways in which the stories of um, our people and of the conflict have been told, those, those just leave out a lot. Um, and I, I think what, what they leave out is uh, also something I want to read to you, and then I can go on to tell, uh, just share some of these stories as well. Since the, uh, the telling of the Punjab conflict in, in the convenient packaging at once keeps the conflict ripe for more academic studies on violence and peace, bolsters Punjab police's arguments for continued resources, frees Punjabi Hindus from problematizing the pogrom politics that were carried out in their name, and creates a ready narrative for Khalistani Sikhs eager to transmit a history of grave injustice and bold rebellion to their next generation. It does not account for the complexities within the Sikh community or diminish the antagonisms. It does not respond to immediate intolerance that prevents any remedies for the conflict wrongs. It challenges neither the moral equivalence of some human rights accounts, nor the chauvinism of some Khalistani accounts. It does not allow for any conversation about celebrating difference against deathly programs of assimilation. It does not challenge prevailing wisdom or prevent inertia. It does not reach those who, like me, were born in the 80s and have simply known that certain questions must never even be insinuated. It hounds hope. And I think hope is a really important word I'm constantly reminded of um, when it comes to our history. I think of the poem uh, by the Polish uh, poet Wisława Strombotska, a line from the poem is a really a favorite one for me. Forgive me, hounded hope for laughing from time to time. And for me, this comes up a lot in um, how I think about Sikh history, how I think about the people whose accounts are in this book. So the way, the way they found hope, one, one very important thing I noted in the book was the way a lot of people found hope was from our earlier history, as well as seeing those trends play out in the contemporary history. And so the book also follows two timelines and each chapter of the book has two timelines. Um, and this is just, uh, this, this image is also taken from the book. And the two timelines are the contemporary 90s and 80s history, which goes in descending order, starts in 1995, the supposed end of the, 
armed conflict in Punjab. And then each chapter it covers one or two years in descending order till the seminal watershed year of 1984 in chapter 10. And then there's a historical timeline of earlier history, uh, history which starts with the end of the Sikh Raj and it's really kind of gone from 1839 in ascending order till 1984. So the two timelines you know, meet um, at the end in chapter 10, which is called 10,000 pairs of shoes. It was an article I wrote many years ago, I think on the 30th anniversary of 1984 of June 1984 massacres. And um, that became the top title of this last chapter that really shows how, you know, I end the book where often the story about Punjab starts for people where they say, oh, 84, right? We're talking about 84. Yes, we're talking about 84, but we're talking about so much, you know, so many undulating layers before and after. Um, and I'm hoping the reader carries on in that journey to kind of ask more questions and develop more curiosity and really feel part of this um, difficult, messy, and unresolved um, history as well. So I'm going to introduce you also, um, well, first of all, to recognize this is not obviously a very historic um, photo. It's taken just some years ago. I took it in Amritsar of uh, Barsa, but I do want to recognize that we meet right now 37 years after the attacks, the army assaults all over Punjab in June 1984. And several, there have been several, several trauma reactions over time that a lot of us grew up with or a lot of us have lived with. Some of my protagonists talked about people they lost in their lives following 84, not who were not murdered by external factors, but who internalized the oppression and the trauma in ways that led to cardiac arrest, that led to substance abuse issues that led to a clinical depression that led to, so trauma has taken, you know, trauma is very physiological. People often think of trauma as, you know, just got triggered, something came up and we just saw, people saw some image again and that's trauma. And it's, it's not only that, it's that too, but it's not that TV version of, you know, the oft uh, just loosely used PTSD. It's also something that we carry in our bodies in very different ways. Um, and as six, I think even memories, even remembrances and uh, times we get together to talk about June 84 can be a little, um, can be very heavy, rightfully so, because we're meeting about something very heavy and grave, or we're talking about something heavy and grave. But I think it also leaves out certain reactions that our people that six had right after 1984 that I believe should be amplified further. So if you'll allow me, I want to um, introduce you to Baljeet Kaur. This is uh, not, uh, this is Baljeet Kaur when I first began talking to her back in 2010 um, and began discovering amazing stories about things she was doing. But what I also want you to think of is the same Baljeet Kaur auntie uh, years before going back, you know, from this is a 2011 picture. So picture her in your mind now to 1984. And her reaction as somebody who was a homemaker, somebody who had hardly followed, I think it's safe to say, had not really been following Punjab politics. She would see pictures of things showing up on television every so often and say, oh, things are gonna go bad, these politicians, you know, just that. Um, was very focused, was working part-time at an airline office and was full-time running her home. But right after 84, she took it upon herself to to join her people. And that's how she just looked at it. And I'm gonna to read to you a little bit about her introduction into this work. She's also the woman in the artist's representation on the cover of the book. So we're going back to 84. I'm reading from the last chapter of the book. It all really began for me, uh, it all really began for me with the Sarbat Khalsa of 1984. Baljeet Kaur remembers her own awakening as a Sikh activist. But she means the larger Sarbat Khalsa meeting that was called after the government's attempt. And earlier in the chapter, I explained the government's attempt at calling a government orchestrated Sarbat Khalsa to say, hey, we're going into the Barsa, we're gonna fix the Barsa. And the people basically, six boy quoted that in pretty large numbers. Um, so she, she's talking about the Sarbat Khalsa on September 1st and 2nd, 1984. She says, the Jathidars called a gathering, a world Sikh convention. The government quickly began blocking all roads trying to prevent people from attending. I immediately took time off from my job and went from Chandigarh to Chural, which is her ancestral village near Patiala, and readied a group of about 10 villagers to go with me to Amritsar. 
my husband warned that I was taking a big risk, that I would get caught by the police and be killed. I told him to completely disown me if I get caught and just say, Sundini, right? she doesn't listen. And I don't have control over this woman. Anyway, so we went. And four days ahead of the meeting date, we had worried about how much they, how much they would, the police, the state, would stop us on the way. They had not blocked the Harike Patnam crossing when we went. We heard it was closed the very next day. Over 150,000 people had been turned away from Harike Patan. And then in Amritsar, the people of Amritsar, of the walled city, were breaking their walls and homes to create passages. They would beckon us over, come from here, no, no, from here. They were opening ways into their Sab. It was really wonderful. She stops to smile at the resilient love. The first day we got there, there were about a lakh, 100,000 people, I was told. By the time we left, three lakh. The Singh Sabs had said, Khane Rene da Sera, Amritsar shared this sirte that the Amritsar locals would take charge of hosting and feeding everyone. And did Amritsar respond? And I remember a free flow of milk supply from all over the Madja region. The big barrels, not the matki pot kinds, but the long barrels full of milk kept being donated. And the food was freely available, of course. And they had in fact to announce that the army surrounding us has also been fed now. We need the influx of food to stop. Imagine that. And with the lakhs of people inside, there were only three toilets, I remember. And let me tell you, they were spotlessly clean. Amritsar locals had really taken it upon themselves. As soon as one person would leave, the women would rush in with phenol and a broom, and they kept things spotlessly clean. In caste-segregated society, bathroom cleaning remains an almost political act in India, even today. And in Baljeet Kaur, uh, and Baljeet Kaur continues to describe her pride at seeing casteless teachings of Sikhi in actual practice in 1984. They didn't let things get out of hand for even a minute. Everything was done enthusiastically. Take our sleeping arrangements. It was raining those days and we were sleeping in the verandas and the people were using jute sacks to soak up water, to keep things dry, to make, us come, uh, make sure we got rest. It was an overwhelming feeling of community. And when she says, imagine that, you know, when she's saying even the army around us has been fed, you know, I, I, I would invite you to imagine that. You know, we think of June 1984, a lot of you are familiar with the accounts, the, the horrors that took place. The same establishment, the same army responsible for killing, maiming, forever um, eradicating so much of a community is now surrounding the community in their bar sub there. You can see their guns, you can see the army. And all and those the soldiers of that army, the human beings, right, and true guru, guru spirit, the actual foot soldiers are being fed by the six. Um, and and they're you know the the jathedars are saying, please no more longer, we're we're good. Um, of course, this is not all to romanticize what I, I, how the community was feeling after eighty four. Baljeet Kaur herself explains a lot of um, you know factionalism that she saw soon after. She explains even that very day how by the time. After the Sarbat Khalsa, the older folks started leaving and youngsters started taking over the state. She's quite convinced a lot of those youngsters were themselves picked up, um, perhaps never to be seen again. You know, she guessed, but she had no idea what happened with them. So there's a lot happening and a lot of brutality still unfolding. But this overwhelming feeling of community and this overwhelming feeling of unity and identity and returning to really the basics um, and the best of the of our teachings and our, our praxis as a community, I think this is something worth holding on to um, as well. We know that 19, June 1980 is before. We have no idea till date how many other Gurdwaras were attacked. I, I recount different sources in the book, 38, 42 other Gurdwaras across Punjab, 74 other Gurdwaras, even hundreds of kilometers away from Darbar Sahib, Gurdwaras were entirely controlled by armies, people uh, by army men, people were brutalized, people were traumatized. And the second um, second person here, I'll introduce you to this is this is this picture is how I had a lot of conversations with him. So this is the why this is one of the pictures I chose to share in the book as well. This is in um, in his ancestral home, you know, uh, this is Indrajit Singh JG would be kind of walking around and this particular one is extremely bloggy and fuzzy, so that's him. Um, but he'd tell these stories about his own involvement uh, in the 80s, how he himself moved back to Punjab in just in 84, entirely switched from his corporate job and corporate life 
um, to to Punjab politics. Uh, in fact, ran and um, and then resigned as a member of legislative assembly for about a year, and then was one of the first people to document uh, human rights atrocities and released a, a famous book that some of you on here who um, were active in those days in reading and following news of Punjab might be familiar, Politics of Genocide, that was by Indrajit Singh Jeji. And so he, he talks about being in this same home that this photo was taken, um, you know, hundreds of kilometers away near Patiala, far from uh, Amritsar, and how his own father, his, his heroic inspiration who had fought, fought British and colonial powers back in the day, how his father after 84 never spoke again. He said, you know, basically, um, as I explain in the book, he, in the Jeet Singh Jeji would say, well, my father, he was an older man and he just felt helpless. He felt, what can I do in the face of all of this? And the stories they were hearing were from a Gurdwara in Patiala, Dukh Nivaran Sahib, right? Again, very far from the ostensible threats that the army was, um, and that the Indian army or the Indian state was dealing with in Amritsar. Um, so th just to recognize once again that people's stories and their inspirations and their telling of their stories began, begin, you know, so much before when some neat kind of history book wants them to begin and their reactions are so much more complicated than what can really be put in any, in any one, um, in any one chapter or re really even in any one book. I'm going to turn to the third person you see on the cover of the book, uh, and in this in this cute picture, he's actually holding the book. This is Justice Bans. Justice Ajit Singh Bans was um, uh, Justice of the Punjab and Haryana High Court, so I think the appellate court uh, level, not a trial, appellate court level of the state. He had retired right before the attacks of June 1984. He was already quite el like he's older. Um, here you see him elderly, uh, 90 five years old, I think, when this picture was taken. Um, but he had retired from, uh, from his judicial position right before 1984, was somebody who was known as a, as a communist, um, not uh, somebody who ever entered a Gurdwara. His family remembers, uh, you know, they would never go to Gurdwara, even on high holidays, on Vasakis and everything else. Justice Bans would say, oh, just, you know, why go and put money in a Gurdwara? I don't trust management there. We just go use our money and hand it to the poor. So somebody not seen very much as some sort of sick um, justice or sick star in any way. Um, but people began to turn to him in large numbers because of the human rights uh, work, including a commission that he um, was appointed to by the government after 84 and surprised the government by um, acting really quickly despite all odds and declaring very bravely at that time that the boys that had been held uh, in various jails after 1984 um, needed to be released because there were no grounds for holding them. So that, that's I'm simplifying what the Bans Commission did, but really he came to, um, came to prominence in the Sikh world, of, uh, in the Punjab Sikh world of the 80s uh, through that act and forever after has been seen as a, as a leading figure of the human rights um, movement in Punjab. So he himself was arrested in 1992 um, from outside the golf club. So we're talking about an, an elite group of privileged people actually, who unlike their other contemporaries, because there are several elite privileged Punjab B6 living in Punjab and as we know across the world, but these folks were exceptional because they really did put their privilege on the line and took a stand. Um, and for that stand, they faced consequences, whether those were social consequences that we all worry about, like you know, the whole, what will people say, um, or very dire consequences at that time of losing people they were working with, of themselves being threatened with jail. Justice Bans was taken in, like I said, in 1992, and he was in jail for six months. The stories from that time, um, the news articles um, are, and also the, some of the reports from when he was in jail are more easily available because he had a relative, his brother lived in Canada, who really spearheaded um, a campaign for the release of justice bans. And as a result, there, there's a lot more documentation. Um, and I think they saved a lot more of the archives from his time in jail. Um, but there's, there was also a lot in just an in Indian mainstream media because here was a justice off the appellate court, retired, a heart patient in jail. So these are just some news articles that um, to highlight that it was getting a lot of attention, right? This is somebody with privilege who's in jail, they can't associate him 
they've made up some really fantastic stories to try to associate him with militants or with something uh, nefarious, but really none of that is able to hold water. Um, the bar associations, this, this particular one is a, um, this particular uh, note is a note he had typed out to the bar association. The bar associations across Punjab went on strike um, and Justice Bans actually at, at some point tells them, you know, please go back to work. You have a lot of work to do. Um, but he got a lot of support um, after his arrest in, in ways that were significant and resulted eventually in him being released. This is him soon after his release. Um, so we're looking again still at 1992. The photograph, um, so the, the man in the center is um, a, a, some, a Canadian who had traveled um, to Chandigarh to meet with Justice Vance because he um, had been involved in the Free Justice Vance campaign in Canada. So Jeffrey is the one who provided um, this photograph to me. And on, so on the two sides is Justice Vance and Mrs. Um, Rachpal Vance, his wife. And the man standing uh, behind them is Rajwinder Bans, who is the who's now a senior advocate in the Punjab and Haryana High Court. He's a famed human rights lawyer of his own right, um, and has worked with Justice Bans and Justice Bans's um, organization from the 80s Punjab Human Rights Organization forever. So that's a, a very a much a younger Rajwinder, but um, I thought this was a, a happy photo. And Justice Bans is in his pretty usual, um, you know, uh, more. Uh, thoughtful state here, but he was very relieved to be out after a few months um, and be working again, went straight back to working on the kinds of stuff that had landed him in, in jail in the first place. But the one thing that always struck me in hearing about Justice Vance's story, including his dangerous arrest and all of that, was the role of Rich Paul Vance. I just wouldn't ever, um, you know, I, I, he would say things like, she's a very brave lady, um, but he would say that, his son would sometimes mention that, um, but anyone else, even including Justice Bance's own um, circle of people who knew him at that time, never mentioned Richpal Bance's role. And yet, when they would show me the documents, the legal papers, um, challenging his arrest and um, all of that, it would always be Richpal Bance versus the state of Punjab. And this is uh, symbolic, not just, it's not just about this case. This is something we see across litigation and uh, legal paperwork in Punjab where it's the mothers, it's the wives whose names, they are the petitioners. They are the ones whose names are, the, they're the next of kin on these papers. They've gone to courts, they've kept relatives interested in cases. You can imagine in long languishing cases over months, um, years, months of, in a case like Justice Bances where they had a lot of privilege and connections and international outrage and all of that. Um, but these cases go on for years and years and it's the moms and these wives and sometimes widows and daughters who um, are often the force behind keeping male relatives interested in going to courts and for, you know, following up with cases and all of that. And yet we never hear about these women. So I, I did make it to Rajpal Vance to ask her what she thought of her role not being known. Um, and, uh, and I'm gonna read you just a little bit because I think her voice is uh, extremely interesting. And it's also one of those that just reminds us of the of the of the fantastic, um, you know, power of the feminine um, and how it should not be stereotyped as kinder or softer or more loving or more whiny or more, you know, there should be no stereotype attached because just by virtue of biology, all women are not uh, at all the same, have different reactions, are individuals in their own right, and we need to respect that individuality. Mrs. Rajpal Bans' little known role fascinates me and I wonder about her background. Justice Bans only mentions it fleetingly, remarking she's a very brave lady. I'm reading from page 142 in case anybody uh, has the book in front of them. Rajwinder, her son, explains that she is not his biological mother. She's much younger than my father. She's my mother's sister, my Masi. My younger brother is from her, otherwise we older siblings, we three older siblings are from her older sister who died when, when I was about two. And at that time it was a custom. A man left behind with three children, has a younger sister-in-law, get them married. She was very young when daddy remarried. At 18 or 19, she managed us very well. And for a long time, we didn't know the whole story. Though my older sister was eight years old and she understood everything, I'm sure. So anyway, it's a sensible custom for everyone, except as so many of our customs go, for the woman. 
For her, it was traumatic, probably. You are taking care of three young children and you are yourself a child. So that did affect her personality, but she is very courageous. And when he was arrested in that scenario, it showed clearly. I remind him that her role has never been acknowledged publicly. And Rajinder says, yes, that's how it goes for us kids. For the day to day, we had always looked to my mother's courage. Like even if there was a snake to be killed, she would do that. She was actually the anchor, management abilities, every practical thing, house construction, school admissions. I mean, dad didn't even know which school we were in actually. Richwal Band, 73 years old when we met, has not lost her spunk. As she recounts various details of the arrest, I remark that she was uniquely outspoken given the times. She sniggers, people have always loved that about me. I asked her about life before she became Mrs. Vance. I was the fourth daughter in our house and the youngest. I had to be feisty. I learned early that if I even wanted a glass of milk, I had to cry and create chaos. I had to snatch everything that was my due. She proudly channeled her rage during her husband's arrest. Such games. I made it very clear. I will take down a hundred of them before going down myself. I am no gidder. The jackal is often invoked as a cowardly contrast to the lion-hearted preachings of the Sikh gurus. See, on the one hand, he's still in jail. On the other, they ask me, should we get him a cooler? It's so hot. I said, no, now treat him like you treat all your other prisoners. And then he had a heart attack in jail. And they called me saying, the civil surgeon is calling you. I said, deal with him. You took him illegally. Now you keep him alive or you face our wrath. And she goes on to explain here, you know, how, how she reacted in, in all these situations where the police were not really calling her out of the goodness of their hearts when they're saying these things, right? Oh, or whatever. Um, they were calling to induce her to make some sort of, you know, compromise as it's called, where some sort of deal families were often told, oh, he's doing so badly. Don't you think if the families weren't already running helter skelter, like in this case, to make some sort of deal with the police, either to give somebody money or to let go of their charges or whatever else, um, or let go of their claims of police uh, abuse and brutality. So, you know, so that this was a way of telling her, simmer down, maybe we can help out, we make him more comfortable inside, we can come out faster. And she just, I mean, she was fire. Um, and, it, and it's really amazing And the chapter traces how she reacted versus even how Justice Banks reacted, who, who is extremely heroic and did all this amazing work, but he really hated being in a cell. I mean, who, who likes being in a jail cell? But Justice Vance's personality is a one of being always outside, even at this age, walks outside for hours a day if he can. Um, and, and he would say, I, I think I, I need to come out. I need to be out on bail. And Rajvinder tells the story of how his mom kept saying, well, you are symbolizing something bigger here. And, we, and maybe we shouldn't yet think about bail. Maybe you should be in, as are so many other six, and you are the fortunate, one of the fortunate ones because you have this power and position and you're not being eliminated, unlike other sick boys who are eliminated um, and who were eliminated during that time. I, I would like to share two more stories really quickly. This is, um, I'm sorry, it's blurry. This is how the book uh, journey as a more of a book started for me. In 2011, I saw this news clipping um, in a newspaper in, uh, I think this is from the Indian Express. And this was about a 23 year old long battle that Lochan Singh Sidhu um, had fought for his son, uh, Kulvinder Singh, who was called Kid in our Punjabi nicknames. Kid was the nickname of the boy who was picked up by the police in front of a whole neighborhood with all these witnesses. His father pursued his case from day one. His father in fact had a fortuitous connection to Baljeet Kaur's family. Uh, Baljeet Kaur uh, in fact talks about how she first met Justice Bance while protesting for, uh, on the kid case. Um, they both, they all surrounded, several of these people got together, surrounded the police station where the new kid had been taken. Um, and then, you know, this, the, the chapter called Two Urns in the book really, um, and the title is extremely sad. It's Two Urns because after everything that Trilochan Singh Sidhu himself did to follow this case, uh, his son's case, and after all the amazing people he got together to work on this case, um, the boy was killed. The boy was never seen again, kid. And all his father got as closure was the police finally handing him two matkis with ashes, two urns, and saying, Saskaro, um, yeah, right? They've been cremated. Pick which one you think is your boy, right? Um, so these are, this is the legacy of, um, you know, th this is how there were parents in waiting in Punjab 
who receive absolutely no closure or receive this kind of callous treatment. Um, the Lojan Singh Sidhu was a, was a hero. And so I, I, the book, even though there's three vehicles of telling the story and I've introduced you to all three of them, the book stories are in fact multiple of people whose names might not be household names in Sikh homes or Punjabi homes even yet, but should be. The Lojan Singh Sidhu is one of them. He fought um, for his sons, uh, for justice, not just for his son, but he also pursued and joined campaigns for justice for so many others uh, while he was doing so. He, uh, soon after this news article came out, he filed an appeal because all the policemen in the case had been let uh, free um, in this case, unfortunately, and he filed an appeal and just a few months later, he passed away of a massive cardiac arrest. He never uh, saw really his son's kid's own kid child because kid had been married just I think over a year or so when he was picked up and his firstborn was uh, was his first um, his child was born after his death. Um, the wife, kid's widow, um, very young widow and child basically drifted away from the Lojan Singh um, and have had their own very separate different life. And this always reminds me of the famous um, works by uh, Cynthia Enlow, who is an amazing feminist writer, thinker, political scientist, who says that wars have their endings inside families. Um, and this connects to the work that I do on domestic violence as well, because wars truly are, there's the stuff we can see outside and the manifestations and how it causes intergenerational harm is so much of what we see in our, in our families. Um, I would like to just, the last thing I would like to share is um, that we, there are, no, there are clearly no winners, whether we tell very um, simplified stories of these times, we tell very glorified stories meant to pump ourselves up somehow that look at our community, we're so resilient, no matter how we try to tell the stories, the fallout um, has, been, has been atrocious for, for human beings who've been involved. Um, in the chapter called Guava and, uh, Guavas and Gaslighting, I share the story of just Beer Puller, who's now a famed um, Sikh writer and author, and how he, if those of you familiar with uh, Chandigarh, he was driving down past Tribune Chonk, the Tribune newspaper has a big board that has the headline of the day, and he saw reading on it, four women killed, including school teacher and two children. And little did he know, that that school teacher was in fact his own sister and her daughters who had been killed by militant boys. Um, they had not just been killed, I'm going to spare you reading um, the details, but the midnight knock that came on their door and their pinned um, in Tarantaran resulted in these women being brutally murdered and their entire village home being set ablaze. So no remains, there were no remains to be found. So once again, in the ashes, an old mother um, goes looking for her child's remains, this time killed by militant gun and by militant um, explosives. And this, uh, this story, I, I trace a little bit of what the Puller, just Peter Puller and his wife, amazingly courageous, good Puller, uh, who was the one who traveled to the village because just Peter Puller couldn't even travel to the village. The militants had given out a threat that anybody coming for the last rights of these women will also be killed. And they thought it would be safer. The family thus thought it would be safer for a woman to go instead of just be a puller, the man to go. So anyway, good puller was involved, but this couple tells this whole story of how these militant boys had this some connection to their son-in-law who they had grown up with. And there was all sorts of these personal animosities that got played out by one side, one set, one boy being induced by the police and being given even a gun in those days by the police and being asked to be an informer and the other boys having joined a militant group they didn't even know about. And then they explain how even these the militants that they knew killed their family members, when these militants were killed, their extended families were eliminated by the police. And so the builders say, like, what, what closure? Like, what happiness? Do you think that happiness that these murderers met this horrible, brutal death? And then their entire families were killed too? They're like, no, of course not. Like, no, there's no happiness um, in that. So I think it's really important. Um, I'll just close on the note of saying that unnuanced, super entrenched, super confident uh, stories are either about this time are either heard from people who have some petty personal political acts to grind 
or from people with privilege of lots and lots of distance um, who really don't see the nuance, don't see the gray. They're not told by um, the, 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 the stories that are told by our real heroes like Paramjit Gaur Kalra, who I'm gonna close on, um, the human rights defender as well as wife uh, and widow of just one Singh Kalra who exposed mass uh, disappearances in Punjab. People like her will tell you that the community for the community, what happened in the 80s, what happened in the 90s, was a beginning of beginning of in in many ways of thinking you know what should justice look like what should closure look like what should unity in our community look like because no closure has ever been brought to any of these families any of these cases and we really need to continue having conversations and may you know may lots and lots of books be written because there are a lot more stories to be heard and to be told so I'll stop there thank you so much Thank you, Malika. That was such a powerful, but also a, a powerful and empath with empathy talk, um, which documents and highlights to us, um, the audience, the events and experiences of people who were caught within the conflicts of the 1980s. And your book gives that voice and records those testimonies, those stories for, for us. Um, one of the questions that I would just kind of like to touch on is you spoke about uh, the, the importance of faith, gender and activism. And when you were talking about Buljeet Kaur, um, seeing how even the army was being fed at that time and the sense of community and going back to the roots of our teachings. Would you like to reflect on the similarities with what is happening now within the farmers' protests? Because there are a lot of similarities that can be seen. There are. Um, and I, at the same time, I wouldn't like to conflate the two things and, and oversimplify either, right? They're, they're very unique and different moments as well. Yeah. Um, but I think the similarities or the same kinds of opportunities that we see in this moment, opportunities to, to really celebrate and think more about are, are on these, the some of the best of our teachings are in, in, are in public display, right? So obviously the longer aspect comes to mind, um, which Sikhs have been doing for themselves and others um, much before the farmer protest, but with the farmer protest, it's just been seen this new model of organizing for the Western world. I often hear people saying, you know, especially since in this country, I'm calling in from California right now, right? So we in the U in USA went through Black Lives Matter protests and racial justice protests in this country. And this idea that without raising money, right, without like instead of raising money or asking for things, the protesters there are giving things. Like people in Punjab from cities who have gone, who have talked to, um, will say, we try to go to support to do something. And we came back like being fully fed, right? And being fully nourished by those protesting. And I think that whole extremely uh, different, non-corporate, non-co-opted um, way of protest is something that's uniquely sick, I, I do think, and is, is providing this model for, for people to to look at and wonder at and hopefully, um, you know, um, emulate elsewhere as well. I do think also, just like after 84, there are a lot of squandered opportunities with the farmers protest now and what else it could be doing. There's, there is stuff we're seeing across caste, but it's not, I mean, I guess we're saying because the Kisan was Durekta, but there's still a lot of caste dominance. There's not as much um, of, you know, Dalit voices. Um, all of those things are things that we've seen in the past as challenges too. So I would say there are similarities in that regard. And then there are similarities in terms of, um, and, and there, there's differences and advancement in terms of gender. When Baljeet Kaur was talking about the Sarbat Khalsa she went to, there's a certain role that most of the women had, right? caregivers, cleaners, cooks, all of that. Um, some took to the stage, some, one, like Baljeet Kaur is walking around with a video camera, making videos. And she continued using this video camera, including at farmer protests in Punjab in the 90s. And those protests, when she's shown me archives, and I mentioned one um, account in the book, 
there are no other women very different from what we are seeing at the at the morcha today right with uh, women being there in large numbers and making uh, really making their presence felt as well okay um there's a hand up from amrik bamra would you like to ask your question oh well thank you very much for uh, the opportunity to ask the question um, this is a very harrowing, it's an ongoing thing which has been going on for 37 years. And yet, you know, we don't seem to find a way out of this. And I think it must have been quite, quite a traumatic experience for you as a researcher to have to sort of sift through all this. I mean, how did you cope with that? Um, that's one question. And the other one is, um, why haven't we organized ourselves? like uh, Simon Wiesenthal, Wiesenthal, you know, who's chasing Nazis right up until the end of his life. Um, have we not found a way? Well, obviously, clearly we haven't found a way. I mean, do, can you see anything like that happening? You know, the, the, the Indian system is pretty rotten anyway. The justice system is pretty ro rotten. Um, you know, that, that's where our problem lies. Yeah, Any thank response? You for yeah, thank you for your questions. Um, the the first one, I think, it was it, I you know it. Doing this work is obviously it's heavy. Hearing these stories, telling them mm -hmm. in a way that feels authentic and ethical, is heavy for sure. But I won't say it was traumatizing. I think it has been overall um, working on the book uh, meant talking to really inspiring people who put my own life in perspective for me very often, put a lot of the current uh, preoccupations for a lot of us in, in perspective where they really thought beyond themselves. Um, and I, I personally found that very inspiring. And this is maybe also has to do with the fact that I've worked with survivors of violence, starting with, um, mm. you know, rape survivors of violence since I was 18 years old. And I think I find something really, really amazing in hearing stories of survival and, and of resilience. So there were days, you know, you hear stories and you're just like, oh, like it all comes crashing down on you. And then the same people, you know, find the lighthearted and beautiful moments. And they would tell jokes in the middle of like, here we were doing this work and, you know, somebody came and they said this. And, and you just remember, this is also humanity. This is also our human life. It's, we don't, I, I, you start, you know, the CJ, you ask this question, you asked, um, is there a way out of this? And, and I understand the way out of it, you mean towards more uh, human rights, towards more justice, not towards closure. But I think trauma is also one of those things that people live with, they never leave behind. People navigate and steward in ways that are um, hopefully better. And sometimes it even makes people stronger. So I, I think individuals I talked to had definitely done that for themselves. So for me personally, it was, it was an immense privilege. And uh, I found answers. I, I found answers first time in my life to a lot of questions I had, like, where are our six? Um, the last, the second question you ask is related to this feeling. Um, I had this feeling as, where are our six doing these things? And they're right there. They've been right there around us. Um, whether or not we've been able to support uh, or not has depended on a range of factors, um, including the, what you mentioned with the with the Nazis and those trials we're living in a very different um, situation currently today. The geopolitics of the region mattered for, you know, how the Nazis, as, as you know, um, whether or not Nazis were gonna get tried in international tribunals or otherwise is very different than whether or not anybody who perpetrated crimes in Punjab is gonna get tried or not. So I do think we have to use the Indian legal system for better or worse. I think there are people who are doing that and they should be supported. Um, I also think we need to keep working externally outside of legal systems. I say this as a lawyer because the law is fallible everywhere in the world and supports the powerful. So outside of the legal system, I think we really need to keep having conversations that correct how we ourselves use language, terminology, how we talk about this time. We're so fixated on the big leaders, who did what, who's an agent, who's not, who gave up you know, on the community too soon that we just don't, we don't focus on the real people making change. We still use words like Operation Blue Star um, instead of saying massacre is an attack. We're still using the army code name to describe one of the biggest events that happened in our history. And, and I think reclaiming some of our own language and narrative is, is extremely important. And that's where I see hope. When I see 
fearlessly much younger children just ask the obvious questions to six non six in Indiana outside um, for all its all of its problems you know sick Twitter is can be really interesting place to be because I'm like when I was 18 I don't think I was allowed to ask those things or say those things and these these kids younger generation is so I, I do think that should be supported um, and we should have way more work on this time well, than we've had before. Uh, yeah, Thank yes, you. I accept, accept that. But I think one small question, uh, if, if you'll allow me. Um, we are quite fortunate living in the diaspora. You know, we have access to open media and everything. Mm -hmm. Can we not motivate ourselves to influence the the leadership in the West, you know, to, to uh, help us, you know? Because, I mean, I know, I realize that India is a, is a investment destination for most Western countries. And that's part of the problem. You know, they don't want to go around uh, upsetting too many apple carts in India, you know, because obviously there's, money is involved. But equally, we have opportunity to um, influence people in the West, you know, uh, powerful people possibly in the West, you know, who can, who can help us. I mean, do you see any hope in that direction? Uh, perhaps, but I, I'm a big believer, and it, that's not at all my domain. I'm not a political lobbyist by any regards mm -hmm. of, and I. Mm -hmm. But there are six who do that well. Um, that's not my. I have never. That's not my area. But I would say the farmer protests right now are a great sign of how the change needs to come from the ground. And there's plenty of people requesting, working, demanding that change on the ground. And I think amplifying their voices instead of telling them from the outside what we want is really important. So like I always say, Rihanna didn't save the farmers protest, right? The mm. farmers saved the farmers protest. If they weren't there putting their lives, those bazaars on the line for all these months, um, we there would be no farmers protest. And they eventually demanded the world's attention on it. The rest, as you said, you know, money does run the world and we're looking at corporatization of agriculture across the entire world at odds with what the farmers want. So. I, I do think we need to listen to what people there want and be supportive of that. Um, the danger of just the desk for organizing or lobbying is where we can be out of sync with what people are asking for on the ground. Thank you, Enrique. Thank you. Um, there's a question from Jasbir Garawal who asks, do you feel a truth commission might be a way forward like Nelson Mandela set up in South Africa? Um, in, in an attempt to get to the truth rather than anything else? Perhaps. Um, again, we're looking at very, very different, not that we shouldn't look at models. So thank you for bringing up um, the model of a truth commission. There have been people's commissions. There's one in 1998 that um, was attempted in Punjab in the very beginning of the book, I explain what happened to that commission. It's very powerful. Um, we also, so we've had people demand those models in Punjab. We have had people attempt them in very dangerous. 1998 was, you know, still very hot and dangerous. Um, and those commissions were scuttled because of um, the state's extreme resistance to truth telling. Justice Bantz is very fond of saying that if the state had just sat quietly when that commission started, he's very confident, he was very confident police officers would have come forward and shared accounts because a lot of them were sons of the same, are sons of the same soil. We all, like I, I, I'll go so far to say that most of you listening, if you're from Punjabi Sikh families, you have army people in your homes, you have police people in your extended families and friends, right? Um, we're all connected. And a lot of those human beings who were in, in these very horrific jobs as police officers have things to say about that time. They, didn't, they don't all sleep very well at night, no matter how we might want to think of them as these monstrous people. They, they are human beings and they may have a lot to divulge. So truth commissions would be amazing, but truth commissions cannot happen without at least non-interference by the state, if not um, actual um, you know, encouragement uh, by the state. And then truth commissions require so much around them um, in terms of there are people who will feel like it's I mean, this is uh, something true for survivors of any kind of violence. So there are people who will feel catharsis in just sharing their story. And there are people who will feel no catharsis in sharing their story. They want their story to propel something else. And unless then we are also ready for that something else, if it's just like, come tell your horrible story that you've tried to 
modify and morph over your life and live with. But here you are now sharing this, these very private details and then nothing's going to happen. That's not going to feel like catharsis either to, to people. So I think, yes, if there was a situation for truly a truth commission uh, with um, enough protective measures that different kinds of truths were allowed to be spoken and then people who are demanding justice had a true way to pursue it, I think that could be that could be a way to go. Till then, um, I would say for those interested in, in stories and storytelling and listening to these stories and in preserving our history, talk to your families and friends and write down their stories. I mean, I say right in the beginning of the book, this is one book, even though it has multiple timelines and stories and all of that. But, you know, may there be a hundred more and soon because we have a lot of stories and a lot of the people carrying the stories are, are dying um, because of, of natural death. They're older and they're their memories aren't as sharp. And so, you know, preserve stories if you can, because that, that is, those are, those are all our truths. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Har Gobind asks, is this book um, a combination of all your research or do you have more material that you will be able to explore other narratives of Punjab as well within them? Um, yeah, I think this is, this is, um, this is the culmination of what I thought could work together as, as one book. I don't see myself as writing another book from those stories, but I do think I hear, or, uh, and you know, it's again, each chapter you'll see with the extensive footnotes is, is all these stories are triangulated, right? These are, um, people sometimes think of the word story as negative. So I just wanna clarify, like these are not, somebody sat up and thought of something one day, like this is their life histories. Um, so I combine these life and oral histories with written history where it exists and where the documentation exists. Um, and so, yes, I, I read, you know, multiple, multiple times more than what's obviously in the book. And I had conversations that lasted years. So obviously they're not all in the book. But um, some of these conversations resulted not being in the book because it just wasn't safe for people to share them, um, mm. for them to be shared. Um, some of them were things that were so extremely private. There was one woman who told me some really uh, fantastic bits of history from her own life, but then also told me bits of history of herself uh, dealing with domestic violence in her life. And those those you know those two accounts really merged for how she was how she had navigated everything, and eventually didn't make sense for a lot of it to be part of a book uh, when she wasn't yet ready to be talking about that publicly. So. Um, so yes, there there was a lot more material that informed this, but no, I'm not like, there's no like part two or anything that I'm planning to write, but I do hold all of that, uh, that material in my head and my heart as I speak and I think about these things. Thank you. Um, there's another, there's a question from Manav who asks, how does one make sense of community pain and forgiveness, Sarbat Dapala moving on and also a sort of pressure to stay integrated and integral to the idea of India while seeking redress for grievances without being seen as unfaithful to the idea of India? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I think what what is interesting that speaks to your question is some of the accounts that I've shared here where these protagonists who are documenting human rights abuses really explain that they were not liked by if they're if people think of it as two sides of the state and the militants they're like we weren't liked by either side and we don't associate with either side um and so they were really doing work that was sarbata pala because they were speaking truth to power on whichever side the power showed up um but they were also very clear that there is um there was a fundamental imbalance of power the militants were also committing horrific atrocities. There were people in the countryside's families that have never recovered from those atrocities. And yet the militants, just like from a human rights framework, anywhere international legal framework, the state is responsible ultimately for what's happening. And the state's power was so disproportionate to the power of non-state actors that these human rights defenders made it a point to focus on state violence and people who've been given, you know, we often hear think about taxpayer money to the police, but it's the same thing. People have been sanctioned by um, the the citizenry to protect and to serve. What they are actually doing um, concerns everyone and should be a focus. Uh, so for these these folks, they 
they really don't see themselves as anything but Indian. Everybody written in the book is like, they see themselves as Sikh. And if there's any country they associate with, it's India. Their parents fought in the, you know, fought the British pre-47. So when they got challenged as you are against India, I mean, they just kind of laughed in the face of that. And they really weren't as defensive as sometimes people tend to be today because they're just like, okay, like you go prove that and you show me what you're doing for you know the betterment of your fellow citizen that you live next door to. So I think they, they kind of brushed that aside and moved along. Um, and I think that might be important instead of getting into word wars with everyone who comes challenging or comes with these easy attacks. Um, yeah, that's what I immediately thought of as I was hearing this question. So I hope some of that made sense. Okay, um, so there's another question. How fast or slow are memories of the traumas of the 1980s fading more generally across Punjab and India? I think the memories are, for anyone who was directly impacted, the memory is as fresh as when it, the incidents happened. Um, and at the same time, Memory is a really, our brains are really complicated things. Memories morph um, and change over time. Uh, and also these people's memories are contending with a state memory and state narrative, which is very, very telling, right? We spend more time in June of 84, um, in Indian media on every anniversary of June 84, spends more time talking about security measures because there's some you know, right wingers coming to protest in Darbar Sahib instead of saying, here's a list of the people still unaccounted for who took off their shoes outside the Darbar Sahib and were never, never able to come back and claim their Jorde, right? We have that sense of humanity, of remembrance, of giving people their due in, in even in their death is, is just not there. So that kind of, that's what people's own personal memories contend with. And so sometimes, people understandably choose to for, you know, undermine uh, certain nuances or they make things very black and white, very yes or no, very binary. So I think that in those ways, my memories slowly changed. Um, and the, the ways in which it's disappearing is perhaps only, I think it only comes with, with death, right? Like that's when people are, are truly no longer here to share or even share portions of what they've lived with. That's what that's where we're losing um, losing our histories. But I, I realize memory is a very complicated thing, which is also why a lot of the people I introduce and whose stories um, are in this book are you know are sit are it, it, I explain the context and the history of like where they're coming from and kind of how much and how their lives may have gone after that. Because if you've lived a relatively safe and comfortable life after a traumatic incident you may have a very different way of telling about the traumatic incident mm. um, versus if you've had one traumatic incident and on top of it, 20 other traumatic incidents and you have no idea where your next meal is coming from and you have no idea. You know, like just those, those people asking folks who've dealt with so much afterwards, um, asking them to go back and say, what happened to you? Is, is clearly not the way we should go about collecting or preserving memories instead of asking them, you know, who are you? What do you think? Like, what are your opinions? That those might be broader questions where then we start hearing little, little bits of their memories of the past as well. All right. Um, Manav has a follow-up question and he says, thank you for answering the Sarbat Dapala question. The follow-up is, that is there a legitimate case to be made for NRC or Kashmir grievances finding common ground with our attempts for redress to hold the Indian state to count? Hmm. Is there a common thread or common so solidarity potentially possible? I think there are, um, I think we, we witness a lot of solidarity between different groups all the time already. Um, and I think the common ground is not, you know, well, we share an enemy. I think we also, or maybe for some people, it's very much a we share an enemy. But I do think people who really work on these issues and want redress and want it in a way that's not, that's contained and not, um, you know, outright violence, even the, the law and legal systems themselves are violence, first of all. So how we use the term violence is complicated. But you know, we're not looking for conflict, armed conflict again, who are looking for ways of things to be done, you know, in some sort of contained uh, way. Those folks realize that 
And the solidarity also has to be based on things we, we share and strengths we share rather than only the common you know, problems we share. And, and I do think people right now, when they're talking about freedom of expression needs to be protected. When people are talking about um, how you know just blanketly things cannot immediately um, go into this farcical, the minute somebody puts something online, you clamp down on them, you dismiss, you know, whatever their accounts are suspended, you go creating some sort of, you know, insane conspiracies. And I think the people who are defending those rights for everyone to speak are doing that not just for their own communities. They're doing that for the sake of any community, any disenfranchised people who need their stories and their voices to come out against mainstream, entirely corporatized India. And I think right now, we're also meeting at a time and a half to recognize when India across class, caste, conflict area, non-conflict area, central India, Northeast India, Kashmir, Punjab, across areas is, is hurting so bad. I right? talked to any physician in India today and they're not, nobody is, this is not, they're not, COVID has made, gone so equal opportunity rampage across India that people are seeing what happens when everything gets privatized, when your government's not focused on its majority of its people and um, is more important, is more focused on its image or more focused on, you know, filling certain corporate coffers. So hopefully that will build this general solidarity that we need the world over of governments to truly care about people. And I, and I think we have that. I don't, I don't think it's a mystery why um, when six talk about 84, you find other religious minorities um, supporting that conversation, but still don't find mainstream um, newspapers picking it up. I think there's there's no like mystery or conspiracy there. It's just like people can relate to that idea of being silenced and that idea of their pain being questioned or being um, made into some, and questioned with usually like bumper sticker argumentation. Like, so people uh, relate to that and that resonates and there is there is solidarity across these communities. Okay, I've got a question, uh, uh, two other questions. One question is, is there a common theme, Karambir asks, is there a common theme message shared by the survivors on what is helping them to move on? Yeah, I, I think, again, I just, um, thanks Karambir for your question. I, I think this idea of getting over things or moving on is not how, I don't think survivors look at it like that. I don't think, you know, just think of this in a larger community sense. When people say 84 happened, move on, please. And then if you're asked this question as a community, what helped you move on from 84? So I, I would just I just suggest that um, please think of it in the same way for individuals. Nobody, there, there are plenty of people whose entire lives are around preserving memories of people they lost, things they lost. Um, and, and they don't want to, that, that feeling that holding on to that loss is something that informs their identities too. So some people really do want to forget about things, just as some people in our community want to forget about 84 and really focus on tomorrow. Um, and there are other people whose entire life trajectory was informed by 84 and they they're re and remembering is everything for them. And we have to respect those varied responses. I don't think there's one theme, but I, I will say, you know, for women, it's very interesting that the number of expectations of continuing to be nurturers, to be caregivers, to still be the person who's teaching your children Tardikala and trying to like model um, generosity, like doing all these things, those societal expectations for some women end up being really crushingly heavy on top of their trauma. On other women rising to those societal expectations resulted in, you know, being forced to be resilient um, but I, I, again, I, I, I'm very careful about not celebrating is that our, our women are so heroic, they dealt with this and then they just moved on. No, it came at great personal cost. And they'll tell you that, right? Like Paranjit Gaur Kalra, who I, I mentioned at the end at one point in our conversation, she said, you know, there were those days I used to just remember so much poetry. She read a lot, she mm. loved literature. Did her life leave any room for that? Like, no, it didn't, right? So from those smaller types of costs to much bigger costs, right? Um, which, which women and survivors have carried with them, but they have, people have risen to their daily demands and that's forced them to, to go on, uh, to uh, go on living along with the trauma that they're navigating, carrying with them. Okay, thank you. There's a question from Gurdas um, Ji who asks, um, 
commemoration marches are still held in the UK. And we just had one yesterday in, in central London. Um, are these relevant or should the 1984 events be marked differently? I think the commemoration, the, I think people should have a right to remember in whichever way um, without hurt, like without physically hurting anybody else that they think is right. I, I think that's totally, I, I would stand for anyone to remember in whichever way they wish. But um, that said, I, I do wish we moved away from entirely focusing on leaders and from any side of any part of the spectrum and so-called leaders. And we really talked about ordinary people a little bit more. And we have document, like people, there are lists, like even in the folks who possibly attended or virtually attended, I guess, the march yesterday, um, they probably have family members that they know who were in their bar sub or other gurdwara in Dukhnevar and sub in Patel, any other gurdwara, right? Um, those lists being read, those names being said, I think is really important. Some of their stories being told um, is really essential so that we remember that this isn't just about this political person stood for this and then this state or this other politician stood for that and they clashed and then there were casualties, right? We, we really need to make a lot more noise no matter who the casualty is about the fact that human lives lost means not just one life, it means an entire circle of people were ever affected. Um, so I wish our commemorations did a little more of that as well. Um, I don't think, I'm, you know, I'm not against commemorations. I, I do wish there was more gender parity in how commemorations happen. I wish stage time. Um, I, and I know not only wish for this, I think me and a lot of other sick women, you know, we, we change this by just showing up ourselves at places, but whether it's a Gurdwara stage or a March um, stage or whatever, we need a lot more women, um, not just for the sake of it here, we have a BB, let's put her in front, but really recognize the women who are carrying the weight. Recognize if you're, if you're a man who has been organizing protests for the last 20 years and no one's ever met your wife, it's time to bring your wife to the stage and have her talk about what it's meant for your family, for you to do this work for 20 years, right? Because she's carried the load of the domestic work at home, which is why you've been out in the community. So if, you know, who, I think we need to really walk that, um, walk that talk that we know from Guru Nanak's time we are mandated to do um, a little bit better in our public commemorations and events so that our next generation truly feels empowered across the board and not only, it's not only certain fragments of it feel associated. Thank you. Um, Professor Dayu is asking that, for example, Tiananmen Square is revisited by the BBC News each year, whereas 1984 is completely ignored. Why is this? Have you thought about that or reflected on? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm guessing it's a rhetorical question. Um, mm. It's one that makes one very sad. Um, and it's very true, right? Just, it's, it's again, geopolitical realities. The real politic is such China is, you know, the easy enemy, the enemy of human rights. We are these Western nations, ooh, whole horrible communists there. And here's the great capitalists. Um, just look at how our, these countries are doing and they should feel quite shameful. But anyway, um, China has a horrific human rights record to be like, let me just put that on record. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, human rights abuses anywhere um, and mass atrocities anywhere should be equally um, talked about and victims anywhere should be equally commemorated. And it's it's a real shame how you know large corporate media um, is entirely silent every June. There's just no doubt that the, we, and we don't have to play a numbers game. I'm not suggesting that. I'm not suggesting we say how many died in 10 and I'm, you know, we, not that, don't let's never get into that. But I think we, we, if we can, just as we do on a lot of other PR stories, if we can influence the media to understand that when an entire community across the world commemorates every year, that should make for news. Um, that, that is, um, you know, I, I would hope more six would spend time and energy reminding editors of, of news uh, channels that they view or read to, to spend time and to oversee their general or their automatic tendencies and corporate tendencies. Um, it's, it's an uphill battle, which is why I think a lot of younger people take to alternate media sources to do the same kind of, um, you know, to do the same kind of commemoration or amplifying these 
these stories and voices. And, you know, and then there's the troll farms and there's all the trolling that happens when people and even media channels deal with that. And I know there's a lot of reasons why uh, certain kinds of, they shy away from certain kinds of stories and think controversial. So again, if we can put the facts, we have enough, even with all the obstacles in our way, we have enough documentation from those years of civilian losses. You know, BBC was um, instrumental, like people think about June 84 and they first think about BBC, they do the Kisonia Sea and they talk about BBC, what they heard. Like, so these, these uh, news channels have their own archives from the 80s, um, from 84, where they could really be uh, drawing from and commemorating these events every year. They don't have to believe in any, any one of us. They can believe their own uh, reporters and editors from when they did this work and their own stringers from back in the day. So um, yeah, thank you for bringing that up. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's true. It's something that needs to be worked on and we need to challenge the media outlets to do a little bit, to do their jobs better. One on, on the last final question. Um, Pooja has asked twice, um, could you just tell us a little bit about the title of chapter four, Next Kill All the Lawyers? Could you just give a brief outline of where that, what that is all about? <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, yeah, well, I think there wasn't something very, very deeply, uh, you know, there's no Shakespearean, like something extremely deep that you've missed in the chapter if you've read it uh, in terms of the title. It really felt that when we were talking about 1992 post a very seminal, um, very bloody election in Punjab, there was an election, the government stood in that way, a lot of Akali people who were six running on that ticket um, were killed on, uh, or six running for that election were killed. And there was a second election called by the government, lots of six boycotted it. A new chief minister came into play. Um, and as soon as that chief minister came in, Justice Vance was arrested. Um, and Justice Vance's arrest, what I kept hearing from younger lawyers who were alive at that time and, and aware, at that, aware at that time and practicing, that his arrest was meant as a signal um, that you are not protected anywhere. Human rights defenders, no matter what affiliation you have, you might be working in the very courts of our nation, upholding our own rule of law, um, but rule of law will be denied to, denied to you. And so that's the chapter is really signifying this overall, or the title of the chapter is really signifying this overall feeling. Now they come for the lawyers, right? Now they come for a relatively more protected class of professionals. Um, and there were a lot of lawyers killed in, in years before and after 92 as well. Um, from just dispenses, again, talking about not just focusing on big names. Right in the beginning of the chapter, I, for example, explained that Justice Bance's associate who led one of the branches of his Punjab human rights organization, Ram Singh, a journalist, was picked up from a bus, a Punjab Roadways bus, just a few months before Justice Vance's arrest, and he was never seen again. And the memory of that and how they had tried to pursue his case legally was very fresh for Justice Vance when he was picked up. And when I asked him, what were you thinking, sitting in that police you know, van, bumping up and down the road, taking you outside city limits of Chandigarh to somewhere else, he said, yeah, I was just thinking what happened to the last couple of guys from our organization was picked up and I was quite sure I'm marked for elimination as well. Um, but then he said, oh, you know, we'll see. I just thought we'll see what happens will happen, right? He just, that's all he kind of remembers from how he was thinking about it. But other people were thinking about it in this way of now they come for any of the lawyers or even the people with more, even more privilege that were perhaps a little more protected before. So thank you, uh, Pooja, I think for that question. Right, so thank you so much, Malika. That was an absolutely fascinating and riveting talk, um, which has kind of given us a lot to think about in terms of the stories of people who experienced um, in the 1980s and 90s, but it also, your book allows us to keep those stories alive and so that we can remember them particularly what their experiences were. And on that note, I think everybody should make, uh, make a concerted effort to purchase the book. Um, you can find it at um, uh, Amazon, but also Palgrave Macmillan, the publishers themselves. Um, and on that note, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for hosting. It was wonderful being here. Thanks for the great audience and the questions as well. Thank you.